After reading chapter 1, you should know that there are three modes of heat transfer, conduction, convection, and radiation, and each one of them has its own guiding equation. So let's start out with conduction. The guiding equation for conduction is Q is equal to K A delta T divided by L. K is a material constant and it is called the thermal conductivity. A refers to the area perpendicular to the direction of heat transfer. Delta T refers to the change in temperature and L is the length. Next, we go on to convection. The guiding equation for convection is Q is equal to H A delta T, where H is also a constant and it is called the convection heat transfer coefficient. A is exactly the same area as above and T is also the change in temperature, same as above. And next we do radiation. So for radiation, the guiding equation looks a little bit more complicated, but it's not. Epsilon E subscript B minus alpha G, which is also equal to epsilon sigma T S to the fourth minus T surroundings to the fourth. Here, E B is equal to sigma T S to the fourth. So now let's talk about what each one of these characters means. Ts is the absolute temperature of a surface. Sigma is a constant. It is called the Stefan Boltzmann constant and it is always equal to 5.67 times 10 to the negative 8. Next we'll talk about epsilon. Epsilon is called the emissivity. Essentially, it is how effectively a surface emits energy relative to a black body. Um, alpha is the absorptivity. So this means the rate at which radiant energy is absorbed. G is irradiation. Rate at which radiation is incident on a unit area. So overall, this entire radiation equation is saying that this is the difference between the energy released due to radiation emission and that gained due to radiation absorption. So now I want to bring a couple more things to your attention. I want you to remember that Q has units watts, so it's basically power. Um, oftentimes you will actually write it as Q with two apostrophes next to it, double dash, and what this means is that it's being divided by the area. So, for example, if you want to talk about conduction, you could also say that Q double dash is equal to K delta T divided by L. This often is used when we don't know the area. As we know, energy can never be lost. So a big part of this class is writing energy equations where essentially we say energy has left this one area in the form of heat and so it went to this other place in the form of heat. However, many times you can gain energy not in the form of heat. So for example, sometimes you might come up with the following equations. For example, Q is equal to I squared R. Or you will also see Q is equal to M dot CP delta T. The first one refers to um, electrical power, and the second equation often refers to mass transfer. And you will see these come up in the class, but they will be explained at the appropriate time. To be honest, at first glance, this question makes no sense to me. But don't worry, there is a methodology you can use to solve it. First identify the modes of heat transfer in the problem. Up here, I have written down the guiding equations for each mode of heat transfer. 
Look in your problem and see if any of the highlighted characters show up in the problem. So, yes, K is there, so that means that we're working with conduction. Next up, you want to look at the image to understand what exactly is happening. If there is no image in the problem, draw one. In this problem, every surface is insulated except for the front of the chip. So whatever heat transfer is occurring must be happening there. A circuit that is on the chip is dissipating heat, so that heat needs to go somewhere. Conveniently, the front surface is exposed to the coolant, meaning the coolant can absorb the heat that the chip wants to release. So now we're ready to start writing the guiding equation for conduction. And you can start filling it in slowly with the information that you know. We know that 4 watts are being dissipated, and Q is in the units of watts, so we can write down 4 is equal to... We also know the constant K, it's 150. And now we have to work through what is the area and what is the length. I'm going to draw a three-dimensional image of our chip. So in this image, this would be the front surface, and the back, back here, that's the, you know, the back surface. Um, and so what this problem is saying is that heat is being dissipated from the back surface and so it must go through the chip, through the chip to the front surface and then it's going to have conduction here with the coolant. So this explanation is cluing us into the fact that L must be the thickness of the chip and A must be the surface area of the front side of the chip because that is where conduction is happening. Okay, so I filled in 0 0.005 squared for the area and 0 0.001 for the length. And so now you are ready to solve for delta t. So by solving this equation, you find that delta t is equal to 1.1 degrees Celsius. Now know that because we're talking about a difference in temperatures, this is also 1.1 Kelvin. It's exactly the same temperature difference. Now take a look at this next problem, which is quite similar to the last one. Since the problem talks about convection coefficient, our guiding equation is Q is equal to H A delta T. This time we are looking for Q. We know that H is equal to 200, and the area is once again 0 0.005 squared. For the temperature, we are told that the temperature of the chip cannot exceed 85 degrees Celsius. So that means that the hottest we can possibly be at is 85 Celsius, and then we must dissipate a lot of energy to the coolant, which is going to have a lower temperature of 15 Celsius. So this is our expression, and we are now ready to solve for Q. If you solve this equation, you'll find out that the maximum allowable chip power is 0 0.35 watts. Similarly, you can solve this equation for the other H that is given to us. So you will have 3000 times the area times the same change in temperature. And that is going to be equal to 5 Point twenty five watts. And you have finished the problem. Take a look at this next problem. Hopefully, this problem made you think about convection and radiation. So, first, let's draw out the problem. We have a long pipe that is not insulated. We know that the surface temperature on the outside of the pipe is Ts is equal to 150 degrees Celsius. The pipe has an emissivity of 0 0.8. And then we also have some convection going, which means that we have some sort of air flowing around here with a coefficient of H equals 10. And it is at a temperature of 25 Celsius.
So we can see that the pipe is much hotter than the room it is surrounded by. And since it is uninsulated, it is losing a lot of heat to the environment in the form of convection and radiation. That means that we can write our guiding equation. The total heat that has been transferred has been in the form of convection as well as radiation. Thus, we have the usual equations. Now we know everything and we can solve for Q. We start out by finding the area. So you know that the area, this area, has to be the area through which heat is being transferred. And so in this case, this pipe is long and it's not insulated, which means that the, the heat is going to flow out of the surface of the pipe. So we have to find the surface area around the pipe. So we write this area as pi diameter times length. And that is going to be equal to 7.85 meters squared. Now let's plug everything in above. And now we need to multiply by the change in temperature, each one of them cubed um, to the power of 4, sorry. But what you have to know is that you can no longer use Celsius here. So remember that for radiation, always use temperature in Kelvin. This is extremely important. The reason for this is because nominally every single heat transfer equation has been written to be used for Kelvin. However, when we're just talking about a regular subtraction between two different temperatures, then the subtraction between temperatures in Celsius and in Kelvin results to exactly the same number. However, because now these equations, each one of these temperatures is to the power of 4, the difference between them is no longer going to be the same whether you use Kelvin or temperature. So you have to use Kelvin here. So finding 150 in Kelvin, that's going to be... 423 to the power of 4 minus 25 is 298 to the power of 4. And so solving this entire equation, you are going to get roughly 18,400 watts. Part B states that the steam is generated inside a boiler that is operating with a certain efficiency. In terms of heat transfer, this means that the boiler uses power to create heat that is then lost to, lost to the environment due to the uninsulated pipe. So basically, the boiler is somewhere here, and it's working really hard, and then it puts in all this heat because of the work that it's doing, puts in all this heat, which then the uninsulated pipe loses. Basically, this means that whatever work the the boiler is doing whatever the Q of the boiler is, is going to be the exact same Q that we just calculated earlier because it is the exact same Q of the heat lost. So Q boiler is equal to the Q from earlier. Now we are being asked to calculate the annual cost of heat loss, aka the annual cost of how hard the boiler is working. Since we know the cost per megajoule, we then need to start out by finding the annual energy that is being lost. So the energy has to be equal to Q from earlier times the time, which is how many seconds are in one year. So we have 18,400 times 3,600 seconds in every hour, which is and times 24 hours hours per day times 365 days per year. That is equal to 5.8 times 10 to the 11th 
joules. So this is where the efficiency comes in. If we know that at perfect operating conditions, the energy that would be used up by the boiler would be this much, then we must now calculate how much energy the boiler is really using because it is operating at only a 90% efficiency. Thus, we divide the energy that we just calculated by the efficiency to find the actual energy. I'm going to put subscript A for actual. And so that is 5.8 times 10 to the 11th divided by 0 0.9. 6.45 times 10 to the 11th joules. So that's how hard the boiler is working. And now if we know that the cost, if we know the cost of energy per megajoule, we can find the total cost for operating the boiler in one year. That's it, we are done. So we found the nominal energy assuming 100% efficiency, then we accounted for the imperfect efficiency of the boiler, and then we had to multiply by the cost per megajoule to find the actual energy cost for the whole year.